brought up Global Women's Strike, um, an organization that you co-founded some time ago. You uh, have been instrumental in uh, coining the term and uh, pushing an analysis around the unwaged work that women do, uh, caregiving work, domestic work. Um, you essentially, with Maria Rosa de la Costa with the publication of The Power of Women and the Subversion of Community in 72, I believe it was. It was. Really opened up what has been called the domestic labor debate, uh, naming that this unwaged, caring work should be valued and compensated by the state. So I wanted to shift gears a little bit and um, talk about how your work around that uh, overlaps, if it does, if you feel it does, with some of the analysis that Maroon has more recently offered in some of his writings. Last year, PM Press, here in Oakland, California, published Maroon the Implacable, a collection of political essays that he's written over the last 20, 30 years. And uh, one of the things that seems to have uh, struck a chord pretty widely amongst readers across generations, genders, is his own critique of uh, some of the sexism that uh, undergirded the political work in the racial justice movements that he was a part of in the 60s and 70s. He has come out and named that uh, he and many of his male comrades of that era were really, while thinking they were working towards egalitarian ends and doing so on a number of levels, not aware of how they were upholding sexism and patriarchy. And he has really uh, pushed contemporary folks in the movement to both study and embrace principles of feminism, matriarchy, uh, men especially. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about what you find most useful, most inspiring about some of that uh, critical self-reflection on his part, and maybe where you feel some of his analysis uh, is missing the mark, because I know that you have some disagreements with him around that, and I think it'd be great for uh, our viewing and listening audience to hear some of that discussion and debate. Well, I think, first of all, that Momia has raised the question at all that he's talking about the sexism of his generation of strugglers and activists and who did such fantastic work. Maroon raising it. That, Maroon and raising Maria it. And as well, yeah. Is really startling and welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how people are responding to that. That is his generation. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they're saying, well, I think Maroon is right, or I think Maroon should shut up. Mm -hmm. I think Maroon is a little right, but we really meant well. Mm -hmm. uh, which is the least, the last is the most likely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Whatever their response is, I think it's tremendously important that he's raised it mm -hmm. and that he's put it on the agenda and that it's going to be very hard to get it off the agenda and probably most people aren't going to make the effort. Uh, on exactly what he's conveying about the position of women, I think um, I think he's not starting necessarily with the right women because now Maroon knows better than I just how hard his daughters have worked mm -hmm. to for him to get him out, to get him out of solitary, to get him to be in general population. Mm -hmm. And they, more than any other people, resulted in his being in general pop. For sure. And I, that would be the place that I would begin. Mm. Who did the work? Mm -hmm. Well, it happened to be women. Mm -hmm. It happened to be daughters. And you know, it is often daughters. Yeah. When it's not daughters, it's mothers or wives mm -hmm. um, or sisters, yeah. you know, and we have this slogan in the Global Women's Strike, mothers, daughters, sisters, wives, fighting for our loved ones' lives. Mm -hmm. And when we go on demonstrations and we have that banner, a lot of women, they take a good um, gulp of air and say, oh my God, 
they're telling it like I know it is. Mm -hmm. And I think that he's very grateful for the work he, they've done, but I think they have to be more of his point of reference. That's on the one hand. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, Mumia, Ma, Maroon and I fight like cats and dogs, or women and men, <laughs> um, or prisoner and visitor, <laughs> about his some of the solutions that he offers for the kind of treatment, violent treatment, that women get at men's hands. And, for example, he thinks that maybe we have to arm ourselves. Mm -hmm. And it, I think he's mistaken. I think he doesn't realize that if women arm ourselves, we'll be shot dead in a minute. Mm. The police, they hate working class men, especially black working class men. Mm -hmm. But I think they hate women mm. more and are outraged at the thought that women would defend ourselves, mm. you know, against violence in that way. Mm -hmm. And that's my first argument with him. Mm -hmm. He's looking to find a solution. That's right. That's what you're supposed to be doing. Sure. And it's very hard <clears throat> to find the solution to a crisis of working class men attacking working class women, mm -hmm. which is very common, mm -hmm. uh, much more common than it should be, and dangerously common for women and for the movement for justice that we're all building. Mm -hmm. It's not a good idea for it to be divided along gender lines mm -hmm. as it is by men's violence, mm -hmm. sexual violence or domestic mm -hmm. violence. And they don't respect us and they think we're, they're entitled to apply for our services by taking them. Mm. Uh, and of course we're fighting all we can, but what we want is for the state to take position with us. You know, the state, you, you know, something happened in um, Ferguson, which is uh, actually St. Louis, which astonished me. We heard about the mother-to-mother -mother meetings mm -hmm. of uh, black mothers, mm -hmm. six or seven black mothers who were on a panel discussing what they told their sons about the police. Mm -hmm. That is how they prepared them for the hostility of the state on the street. Yeah. And we were having a discussion with two black women and two white women. They were telling us the two white women had met, in fact, at one of these meetings because they had six or seven black women, but they had 200 white women who had come to the meeting. And some of those mothers who'd come, white mothers, had black children, so they had to find out from black mothers what, how to educate their black sons. Yes. And they were eager to know everything. And they were both overwhelmed, the white women, by what the black women faced when trying to raise black sons. And um, when they were finished, I said, and how are police on domestic violence? And each of the women had a story about her own domestic violence, which was significant in itself. Mm -hmm. And secondly, the police were brutes in relation to them. <laughs> so where they had begun by saying, well, we don't face the same treatment by the police, they then moved to say, well, I guess the police don't like us very much either. Mm -hmm. And there was much less of, uh, I don't, I, I, I'm treated fairly by the police. They weren't. Of course not. And it was terribly important for them to acknowledge that. They knew that before we asked. But you know, there's one thing about seeing your own situation and how it relates to other sector situation, because it looks so different in Technicolor, mm -hmm. perhaps, mm -hmm. than it looks um, uh, black on white or white on black mm -hmm. and um, I think this kind of 
treatment by the police is something that I think men should take into account, and especially black men who uh, face murder at the hands of the police, but they have to see who else the police is are you know are repressing and oppressing and torturing and then claiming that their hands are clean and that they are upholding law and order they're upholding what they feel like upholding and they call whatever they want law and order and we have to know that and men have to know that and men have to know that if the police are defending them against women when they have been, um, but when they have been violent against women, that there's something really wrong about which side they're on, uh -huh. and I think that's one lesson we have to learn. Mm -hmm. And I think a man like Maroon, who has such such respect from people because they know his record is clean, he didn't scab, he never stopped. He wanted always to continue. He kept himself together in all kinds of ways. It's not easy to be in solitary confinement. You know, I, I'm, I'm a pre I appreciate that now, knowing two men who have gone through that and they have found tactics to keep themselves in one piece that only the most dedicated and dis self-disciplined people can do. And they have to know men like that and speak out about not merely men's sexism in the abstract, mm -hmm. but the fact that men must take position with women. And if they don't, they're on the other side. And they're on the other side in the justice movement, not only on the other side of women as a secondary question, but they are siding mm. with the police mm. against us. Mm which in fact is really the case and I don't I, I, I think I think Maroon and I have to talk more mm -hmm. about exactly what women face at the hands of men at the hands of employers at the hands of the state and at the hands of women who have power that's the other question which is which is terribly important because a woman like Hillary Clinton now calls herself a feminist. feminist. Nobody says she's not a feminist except us in the global women's says Is that feminism? Mm -hmm. I don't want it. Any of it yeah. If it's not feminism, then call it. Mm -hmm. You know, the f f fem women who call themselves feminists have to decide what they think about women who have power and exercise it on behalf of the same forces mm -hmm that men in power exercise a power against us and they have to say what they think and which side they're on. And I think somehow that Maroon is gliding over um, precision in judgment which would reach other conclusions mm -hmm. and would open his mind more. But the point about him is that he is determined to be on women's side and he's determined not to allow anything that men do against us to pass without his uh, condemning it. And that's a big power for us and we haven't yet worked out all the ways that we can use that. Mm -hmm. But can I give you one indication of what might happen? We want to know really from prisoners, and I've really had this in my mind a long time, what they think of men who are inside for rape mm -hmm. and other violence against women, and against anyone, unless it's against the state. That's different. Violence against the state is a response to state violence. Mm -hmm. The other violence is initiated by men and men have a power to begin with over women because men are more likely to have money when women do not. And men are more likely to be they're backed by the powers that be. You know, so men come into the relationship on an unbalanced way already. The power relation is being reflected. But now we want to know from the men inside 
what they think of prisoners who are there because we've uh, we've been persecuted by them and we got after a struggle we got them convicted we don't like to convict anybody mm -hmm. we don't want jails right. we want to eliminate that but meanwhile we have no recourse mm -hmm. and we must make the state act for us and we know that to the degree we that we get the state to act for us to that degree, we will be cutting down on the amount of rape and male violence we face. Mm -hmm. Impunity is a no-go. Yeah. That's great. Thank you for all of that. Quite in-depth, and I'm sure that Maroon will appreciate the candidness and the transparency there, and hopefully supporters as well. And, the, and really the sympathy that I have for any man who's trying to find his way out of that, mm -hmm. you know, that bag. I think it's wonderful. Yeah.